Hello, and welcome to Leadership as a Philosophy, Not a Checklist, bonus discussion, lecture discussion. Uh, the discussion that I want to do today is on solitude and leadership, which was a lecture given by William Derezowitz. I apologize if I mispronounced his name. Um, William Derezowitz was a professor at Columbia and Yale. He's got a PhD. He wrote a book called Excellent Sheep which is very good. I read it. Uh, he also has written a book called The Death of an Artist, uh, which has come out just recently and I have not read it. Um, but he is, his title is a cultural critic. And the main angle of what he has talked about is that we're not doing a good job educating our young people and we're sending them off to college to do things that maybe they don't want to do or we're giving them an education that is only marginally useful um, for what's going on in life. So this lecture was given, I think in 2009, uh, I don't wanna get the dates wrong, uh, but he gave the lecture in 2009 to the plebe class of West Point, so that would've been the class of 2013. And uh, he talked about solitude and leadership and all that sort of stuff. I read the article in 2010 uh, and I was, this was sort of right in the middle of when I was wrestling with all of the stuff that I talk about in my videos. And so when I read it, I was going, yes, yes, yes. Where's the solution? Yes, yes, yes. Where's the answer? And so here we are several years later where I feel like maybe we've got the answer or at least are able to answer some of the questions that were in that lecture. I've given this lecture out to people several times, printed it out, people that work for me handed it to them uh, and tried to have discussions with them, but several times they would read it and didn't understand. Um, I have wanted to have a discussion with somebody about this for a long time. And so I'm very excited about this today because uh, like I said, I've read it a bunch. Uh, I have tons of respect um, for Mr. Derezowitz. So uh, the fact that he was able to articulate it so clearly uh, made it something that I kept going back to saying we have to be able to answer some of this stuff. So I'm going to jump right into the PowerPoint part of this. Um, I highly encourage you to go read the lecture. It's, if you put it in a Word document, it's 17 pages. So I'm going to do some summaries and talk about some themes, but I still highly encourage you to read it and to read his books because the books are great. I'm not sponsored, not promoted. I don't get make a penny off of any of this. But Excellent Sheep is very good. And so I assume that The Death of an Artist is going to be great as well. I just haven't read it. All right. That's all for this. And right to the PowerPoint. Thanks. All right. Before we get started with the rest of this discussion, I really highly encourage you, if you have not, to go watch the Leadership as a Philosophy playlist on the YouTube channel that this is on. The reason for that is I'm going to make a lot of references to those aspects of leadership. Uh, and so some of the concepts that I'm going to talk about will be discussed at great length in that area. So if, if you're going along and you're not sure that you understand what's happening, that's why. Okay, so we'll get right into it. First thing that he does is he starts off with something that I talked about in the prelude. Um, where he says, when we think about great leaders in history, we think about Washington and Lincoln and, and Martin Luther King. Well, what do those guys have in common? None of them went through professional leadership training. None of them went through any of the crazy stuff that we have to send people through now. Now, he was talking to West Point, a West Point class, and uh, the thing that was very interesting, he said, look, how did you guys end up here? Uh, and he also talks about how that refers to the Ivy League and all some of the stuff that they went through in order to get to that college. So the one thing that I want to discuss before we get into all that is why solitude? So wh why did that, why did this resonate with me? Well, as a leader, when you're in charge of a team, you're not doing all the work. Your specific job, the thing that you have to be able to do is before the mission happens, before the operation happens, before you go into work that day, before you start a new strategy with your business or your organization. Well, here's, here's where we are. Here's where we're going. 
and here's all the potential things that can go wrong along the way. We need to be able to stop and think about that because how many people do you know that if you say, ooh, well, what about these four things could go wrong? They're going to spend all their time panicking about the four things that go, could go wrong and you're just thinking about them. So you got to do that by yourself or find a mentor or if you've got a close friend, which we'll talk about at the end, that's what you go pay attention to. But leaders, here's three or four options and then here's all these different branching scenarios. And as you're going through the day, the operation or the mission or your daily thing or the big long term strategy, as you get close to that problem, hey, let me go pay attention to that for a minute. Oh, hey, we made it. Nobody else needs to know, but you're prepared for it. And you have to do that by yourself ahead of time because there'll be a whole bunch of people that want to tell you no and it can't be done and it's impossible and all that sort of stuff. So talk about certification bias. So the, the main focus of this article is we spend all this time telling people, hey, if you want to make a bunch of money, uh, then you need to be in management or need to be in leadership as well as other things, right? You want to be a doctor or a lawyer, any of those sort of things. So we're going to take somebody and you got to run through and jump through a bunch of hoops and show how amazing you are as an individual in order to get into an institution, Yale, Harvard, Naval, uh, uh, sorry, um, Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, any of the military academies, you got to have 12 things that show how amazing you are. And then you go to this institution, college or military academy, and during that whole time, they sit there and brag about how now that you have made it and you're the top 1% of the 1% and you're so amazing that you are now going to go out and be a leader. We're educating the leaders. We're making leaders. And then you go out and you've spent the past 22 or 23 years of your life trying to show how amazing you are as an individual. Well, where's the problem with that when it comes to leadership? Well, what's the first thing that everybody says and that we talk about in the philosophy? Humility. How are you going to be humble if you've been told for your whole life and for the past, let's just say, eight years, you've been trying to make yourself an individual look as amazing as possible? And then you say, hey, now go be in charge of 30, 40, 50, 100 people, and all of them are much smarter than you at that job because they've been doing it and you haven't. Well, that's where the problem starts, right? That's the root of the whole problem. Is, is is now you have somebody that walks in and goes, well, because I have gone through this thing, I'm now an expert. Have you done anything? No. Um, and so another point that he talks about that I find fantastic um, is, you know, this makes you self-centered. This makes you a narcissist. This makes you thinking all about yourself. and your. So when is your philosophy developed? When are you given time to go look at throughout history, past thousand years, 2000 years, all of the times that leaders failed and had these issues? Um, and, and then this is a point that he talks about that I love because we've talked about it. There's a definition chapter. He says, um, I'll just read it real quick. He said, leadership and aptitude, leadership and achievement, leadership and even excellence have to be different things, otherwise the concept of leadership has no meaning. Well, that's what we talked about in one of the other videos. Just because you are the most competent, so you're the leader in your field, that just means you're the top of the competence hierarchy. You know, you're the, you're the leading producer of such and such. Well, that just means you're the top of the competence hierarchy. So you have to say people leadership. It's, you have to differentiate. So my question is, this is sort of a question. Is, is the word leadership correct for leading people? Or is do we have to come up with a different word? Or do we stop using leadership for being the top of a competence hierarchy? I don't know. You tell me. Um, all right. Yeah. So either word is being used too often for too many things, or it needs to be a different term for leadership of people. Remember, like I said, a leader to me, it's a person that's keeping an eye on chaos and somebody that you would voluntarily follow to another location, regardless of pay. Well, that's leadership, right? Not in charge ship, which is what we do. We take all these people, run them through the system, make them systems experts, and then go say, now you're in charge. And all they do is try to treat people like a system. Nightmare. 
Um, so yeah, so this is where he talks about one of his students said, well, all we are is excellent sheep because you're all exactly the same. You know, there's no diversity in that group because everybody has done 10, 12, 14 extracurricular activities. Everybody's a straight A student. Everybody is, they've all gone, done the exact same thing to get through the exact number of hoops. There's no, there's no diversity in that group. Everybody's exactly the same. You know, next thing you know, they're bragging. Oh, I did 17 things. Jeez. Talks about multitasking in here too, saying that realistically you can't multitask. You just do everything poorly if you're multitasking. You're not really paying attention. All right. So then he goes through and talks about the heart of darkness and the bureaucrat, which amazing. If you haven't read the heart of darkness, you should. Um, and so what we've done, what he says that we have done is that we've created a bunch of people that are great at manipulating systems and jumping through all the hoops to get promoted and to get ahead. Where's the focus on the employee? Where's the focus on people? Where's the focus on the people that are, going to, that are going to enable you to get the job done? The only reason, if you're a leader, that you have a job is because of the people in your organization. They are the priority. So you need to spend all of your time thinking about them and what's going to happen with them and how to protect them and how to keep an eye on them. Um, not to manipulate the system. So then what happens, right? We all know it. You get somebody who's the, the expert at manipulating the bureaucracy and they rise to the top. Why? Not because the people beneath them say, oh, I'll follow that person. It's because they do the system so well. The people above them go, oh, that person's getting results. Yeah, and everybody's miserable and everybody hates them. And if they had the chance, they would walk off the job right now, but they need the job. Which goes back to my whole point. Why don't we do everything we can to identify people ahead of time that have the leadership talent and then give them the wisdom, the philosophy to be good at being in charge? Because you, you need management, right? But you need somebody who's a leader who's going to make sure the management's not becoming tyrannical. Anyway, so what happens when you have somebody that's great at manipulating a system, right? Um, they, you end up with no leadership talent because you've got manipulating the system talent. And you don't have humility because everybody's, well, I'm, I get great results. I'm amazing. Okay, so? Um, and no empathy and usually no integrity. Because if you're trying to weasel your way up the system, you're going to cut some corners at some point, which means people don't trust you. So then we don't have, you know, the speed of trust like we talked about before. Um, oh, right. So when it comes to manipulating systems and having bureaucrats, the, the blanket of bureaucracy, which was in chapter four or section four, whatever you want to call it. Um, that is the justification for having a leader at every level. There's got to be a leader keeping an eye on the bureaucrats. You know, somebody who goes around and, oh, I'm going to make sure that I'm the sticking point. You know, you know that bureaucrat. I'm going to make myself, nothing gets done unless I sign this piece of paper. Well, how did that happen? And what does your signature have to do with anything? Right? oh, hey, this is going to take us three weeks when realistically it's just a decision, yes or no. That's what the leader's there for. Somebody, There's got to be a way, there's got to be an escape route in an organization for somebody to walk over and say, I'm trying to get this done and it's not complicated. Why am I having to get 17 signatures? Well, that's a bunch of bureaucrats that have made themselves so indispensable to the thing that they're causing problems. So the leader needs to go fix that system. Because what does a signature do? Nothing, right? What's my next section on here? Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I went ahead. So he talks about that we've got a leadership crisis because we are training people to keep the routine going, which is exactly right. If, if you have gone through all that stuff like we talked about, even let's, let's talk about an MBA. And I'm not going to not, not knock an MBA. I don't have one. So you go through all this stuff in high school. I have to get into this amazing college. Okay. So you're standing out above the crowd. Then you go to college and you have to be an outstanding student and do all these things to make sure that you're an amazing candidate to be an MBA student. Then you go get your MBA. Then you come out at 24, 25 years old and are now a certified leader. When have you ever been in charge of a person? 
When have you ever had to see what people are going through? When have you ever had to see how your crazy policies are going to impact the people on the front lines? You, you haven't. So what the heck are we doing? But what we do is we teach all these people process and metrics and dynamics and this and that and the other thing. So everything has to be measured and everything has to be quantifiable. Well, most of the leaders, the genuine talented leaders that I know, you can't measure them with a metric. You go put them over somewhere and things just get better. Well, what did that person do to make things better? Well, they did that. You can't measure it. You can't measure taking care of somebody. The example that I use in one of the other ones, somebody comes in, I've got a catastrophe happening in my family. Like, get out of here, go away, take off. Well, I just sent somebody out that cut productivity. Okay, well, I got to fill the gap in the productivity. I got to attune the competence in the environment in pursuit of the goal. So I run over there, do all the fixing, get everything squared away. That person comes back, they're going to work their butt off for you because you took care of them in their time of need can't measure that. I can't put a number on that. Oh, they're going to be 17% more productive because I took care of them. Because if they know that you're just doing it in order to manipulate them, it's not going to work. It's got to be genuine. That's where empathy comes in. That's where integrity comes in. So we're training a bunch of people to be in charge, but we're not training leaders. Why? Because we're not identifying in all of that hoop jumping. At no point have we evaluated that person being in charge of somebody. So, so, what, so what the heck makes us think that they can lead? We don't know. You don't know. This person is completely untested and they go out into the world and they've got all these systems and all they know how to do is pull levers. They have no idea how to deal with people or to lead people unless you observe it. So um, I'm missing something here. Right. Talked about that. So this is what I love. He says it. It's a great line. It says we need leaders that can think independently, creative, flexibly, creatively, flexibly to deploy a whole range of skills in the fluid and complex situations. Correct. How do you do that if you've sent people through checklists? How do you do that if you've said you have to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or you'd get nothing? You can't get somebody that's a free thinker. Now, that's where we talk about identifying the talent, which is in the solution chapter, right? How many times did you end up in charge of stuff like Marin Alsop was? How many times did you just end up in charge? Probably not seeking power, just ended up in charge. You know, when something when something's crazy is going on, who's the person that comes up with the creative ideas? Not, well, let's try the system harder. The system got us into this failure. Well, let's work the system harder to get us out of the failure. No, it's not going to work that way. So how do you get somebody to think independently and creatively when you've given them this 19-step process to get ahead? You can't do it. It doesn't work. Um, so one of the things that I found interesting is he gave a quote from one of the uh, cadre at West Point. And the officer, or the quote was, uh, the model for our officers, which has been built on a model of the citizenry and reflective of the democratic ideals, was to be different. They were to be possessed of a democratic spirit marked by independent judgment, the freedom to measure action and to express disagreement, and the crucial responsibility never to tolerate tyranny. Okay, that sounds amazing. I was in the Army for 21 years and I met three people that, that suited that. So what are we doing, right? We're not identifying the right people to develop as leaders. We can't teach anybody to be a leader because if that was the case, then we would have this ideal. But I worked for a couple of tyrants. I witnessed a couple of tyrants. And if you raised one voice, they were going to destroy your soul. And it still happens now. I said the example, there was a soldier that I talked to recently super smart, super sharp guy got out. I asked him why he got out and I'm not in, I'm retired. He says, oh, I, my, my wife was having a miscarriage and we were set up in the parking lot with some tents doing some little drills. And I went to my officer and asked him if I could go 
go see my wife because she was in the hospital having a miscarriage. And he said, no, this is critical. Well, that guy went through that school. That guy went through this process. So clearly we have a great goal, but we're not evaluating. We're not seeing if our goal and our results are, are attuned. I was mad. I was mad for two days after that, and I'm not even working for that guy. So we, we, have, to, we have to put the right people into the system. And how do you identify them? Well, that's the, that's the solution. That's the proposed part of the solution chapter. So, yeah, I said that already. All right, so here's something else that he talks about that I really enjoy because I've talked about it several times. You need, as a leader, to have time to study. You need to study what in order to be a leader of people? Human nature. Well, what's human nature? Philosophy. Go back and read some of the classics from the past couple thousand years where they talk about here's what human nature is. Right? I went and I just recently read Uncle Tom's Cabin and was kind of stunned because when I got finished with it, I said, wait a minute. That is, you would think that that was man's search for ultimate meaning, but longer. You would think that it was an abridged version of the Gulag Archipelago. And so human nature is to, you give people too much power, bad things are going to happen. So what the founding fathers were trying to do with leadership in the country. But it's the same thing in an organization too. You give somebody too much power, they're going to run rampant with it and they're going to start crushing people's souls and they're going to end up being bad because nobody's checking their power. Well, great. That's a great thing. That's human. That's philosophy. That's not, there's not, it's not in a management book somewhere. Here's the four checklists to make sure that you don't have power. Eesh. And then, and then this close friend and mentor thing is fascinating because you want to talk something through, you have an idea, you have to go talk to somebody about it. Well, if everybody around you is immediately going to say that you're a fool for thinking that way, what are you going to do? You're not going to think. You're just going to say, well, I know that these seven steps are going to be what gets me ahead. So I'm going to do the seven steps and not worry about it. And, and, and that's terrifying, right? That's terrible. That's why you get those people. Well, we've always done it this way. So that's the way we're going to do it. I don't want to question anything because the last time I asked a question, I got squashed. You know, and so that's when you end up with people that are natural leaders that come in and say, hmm, let me see where I can get into this system so that I don't, you know, I know who not to talk to so that I can just do what I want. Well, that's still dangerous, too. There should be a person you call and say, here's what I'm doing and here's what makes sense. It's a problem. Um, and so that's that. Now, this to me is the one thing that, that, well, not the one thing. There's a lot of things in this article that were just amazing. But he talks about how do you prepare yourself for when things are going crazy and things are going chaotic. So... He gives an example in here, you know, you're going to go out in the army and you're going to go to a place where there's some hazing thing going on and soldiers are being abused top to bottom and your second in command is part of it. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I don't know. Um, and so none of that stuff is taught in these checklists because the checklists are all predicated on here's some set conditions and here's the solution you get with those set conditions. But I don't really think that we're teaching people what leadership really means if we're in leadership courses or we're in management courses. Because leadership, if you're doing it right, takes a lot of time and it's lonely and you're responsible. You know, if the team is successful, the team was great. If the team failed, there's probably a leadership issue. And so you have to be able to think through all that sort of stuff. You do have to think, what am I going to do if I go somewhere and find out that that somebody was was stealing money, you know, or I find out that my boss is corrupt? Am I going to turn that person in? Or am I going to keep my mouth shut? You, you, you got to be able to think through that stuff. And how do you know 
what some of those things are. Well, you have to have people that have been leaders and that have had to go through those things, talk to people that are going into those things and say, here's some of the things that can go wrong. Here's some of the things you need to be willing to think about and start thinking of stuff that's similar to that. But you might not ever encounter that. You might encounter something that's completely different. I had a couple of situations in my career where I had a situation, walked in, found out that something bad was happening, and the people that were above me said, if we start doing an investigation on this, you could get fired. And I said, it's worth it. I said, if if this is going on in my organization, because I have a, I had a feeling something bad was going on. So if this is going on, I would much rather that it stop and get exposed than worry about my career. And the guy that I was talking to looked at me and blinked and said, okay. And we ended up doing it. And I didn't get fired. And it was worse than I thought. So pretty bad. Um, so one of the things that that you should that we talk about all the time is go find a mentor. Well, a mentor, if you know, if you're finding somebody that's just teaching you how to play the system, that's not a mentor. You have to find somebody that you can go talk to and say, look, here's what I'm trying to do. What's the real answer? What's the real solution to this? Anyway. Um, so that was basically it. I want to see if I missed anything in here. Mm. Yeah, I mean, here's a great one. So this is the conclusion to the chapter, and I'll read this. I mean, the chapter of the speech. He goes, how can you know that you're going to be ready to go lead unless you've taken counsel with yourself in solitude? I started by noting that solitude and leadership would seem contra contradictory things, seem to be contradictory things. I apologize. But it seems to me that solitude is the very essence of leadership. The position of the leader is ultimately an intensely solitary, even intensely lonely one. However many people you may consult, you are the one, however many people you may consult, you are the one who has to make the hard decisions. And at such moments, all you really have is yourself. So that's what we talked about at the very beginning, right? You got to sit there and go through all this sort of stuff. Well, what's going to happen if I do A, B, C, D, E? You know, here's this. Here's this person that I want to put in charge of this section or this team. However, just like we talked about in the problem, that person has abused everybody that's under them. And now I'm going to move them somewhere to a higher thing because they seem to be performing better. But do I really want to reward somebody who's abusing their people? Or do I go try to fix them? Are they save are they salvageable? As leadership. Um and so that's about that. I'm going to pause real quick and go through to make sure I didn't miss any of my notes just because I want to, want to be clear. So hold on for just one second. And I'm back. So the one thing that I forgot out of this whole thing is uh, he has this great line where he says, I find for myself that my first thought is never my best thought. Well, that's what the whole solitude thing is. Normally, if you have been trained on a bunch of checklists and somebody says, I got this problem, blah, you go, ha ha, answer. And about half the time, you haven't even had a chance to think about it. One, there might be a better solution. Two, it might be a bad solution. And three, you might, you might, none of the stuff that you've ever done before might not apply. And so you do have to have time to go and think about it. That's why he talks about solitude and leadership. You have to take a minute to step away from stuff. The, the leader, remember we talked about it in the hierarchy chapter. So where is the leader? Well, sometimes the leader is all the way over here by themselves outside of the organization looking at the environment and checking the hierarchies. Remember that shell. Leaders at the top, at the bottom, at the side, and behind over here checking on this by themselves because the team is doing all the work. Right? You might have to go do something to interject yourself and, and take over and solve the, you know, save the planet. But you have to be able to think about these things that nobody else has or nobody else has seen before. And so I this one to me has been amazing because a lot of times I'm the same way. 
I hear something and go, ah, there's that. You go, wait, did I say that or is that somebody else? He talks a lot about social media being an invasive species, which of course it is. So, you know, sit down and think about stuff. And that's what it takes. And sometimes, you know, if we're going to apply the philosophy, you may have a thing. Hey, here's this problem, blah, 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 blah. And then you think through it and you say, well, I could go over there and fix it right now. Or can I develop, give this as a chance to one of my junior leaders to, to solve the problem? Can I let the team work it out? Perhaps I don't have to do anything or perhaps I have to do something radical. You got to take all time, a bunch of time to think about that. And you have to apply vigilance and empathy and humility and integrity. You know, it might be so catastrophic that you have to act immediately. Or it might be so banal that you go, yes, I hear your complaint. Go do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Which I've done that before, too. Anyway, highly encourage you to read the article because it really talks about what we've said at the beginning. All these people are going through all these systems and all these hoops and then we go put them in charge because they could jump through the hoops. Well, never once did we put them in, in leadership. I mean, he doesn't even talk about how to evaluate leadership. But that's what I thought was missing when I first read this way back then. It's like, well, if, if this is the answer that we're getting with all of this training, something's got to give, which to me is we're not picking people with the talent to put into the system in the first place. And giving somebody a certificate isn't going to help them be a leader, we have to go see them in charge of people or working with people. You can't train, you can't send somebody to get a master's degree in how to work with people. You got to go have them work with people. Anyway, appreciate everybody's time. Uh, I really enjoy this. And like I said, I really hope that you go read this and the books. He has not paid me any money to, to talk about these, but they're very thoughtful. And, and it makes you think, because once again, he sort of states what we all can see but can't put our finger on. So thanks so much for your time. Have a great day.